one or two announcements. Uh, first announcement is uh, don't forget about a party tonight. Um, that's at 8 o'clock, and there's rides. Well, you can read it. There's rides at 745. Um, there's also, in your packet, there's a form for reimbursement. Uh, I think we're trying to get those in by tomorrow, so um, just do, do them. Um, uh, there's a brochure outside of Unleashing Life. thought that was funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, come to Athens, and this, this is the thing, so yeah. Um, I think that, is that it, Will? Or? Okay. <laughs> More than enough. Uh, okay, so we have the last talk today, and it's uh, Matt Clay from Arkansas, we're very happy to have, and uh, he's going to talk about uh, algorithms for full ear disability. Thanks. Okay. All right. So uh, thanks to uh, the organizers, Dan and Will, for uh, inviting me to give uh, a talk, and thanks for uh, coming to listen to my talk. Um, so uh, yeah, our work was really motivated by the following question, um, can you detect if an automorphism of a free group is irreducible? probably tell by the title, uh, the answer to this question is yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, let me go ahead and give you sort of the, uh, the 30 second or minute long version of the algorithm just in case, you know, being the last talk of the day, if you get tired and goes off a little bit, um, at least you'll get something out of it. Um, so sort of being irreducible uh, for a free group, and I'll write down, you know, more think more precisely here in a moment, means that there are no uh, periodic uh, free factors. Okay, and so what the main theorem that I'd like to talk to you about today, what we show is that if we have an automorphism that is reducible, well then it in fact has a, a periodic free factor whose volume is small in comparison to the word length of the automorphism. So I'll talk about you know, what it means to say the volume of a free factor, um, but essentially then the way the algorithm works is you know, someone hands you an automorphism, you just you know, take a, a random guess at what the word length is, just decompose it into some generators, Look at all free factors whose volume is pretty small and just test them. And if you find one, well then you're reducible, and if not, well then you're not, uh, then you're not reducible. Okay? Okay, so let me go ahead and uh, define these terms a little bit more and be a little bit more precise with that. Um, so, uh, so let f be a free group. Uh, say the rank of f uh, is at least two, but finally generated. Um, and talk about the complexity of the free group, um, which is just uh, three times the rank minus three. So you should think of this as being you know, something like the number of curves in a pansy composition, if you like thinking about surfaces. But I mean, there's other ways to think about this topologically for f, and I'll mention some of those in a bit as well. Too. Okay. Um, so then, yeah. So actually, what we'll be working with is not automorphisms, but outer automorphisms. So the group uh, out f is just the group of automorphisms quotient out by those that are inner. And so elements in here sort of naturally act on conjugacy classes of things inside of F, right? Are you able to also prove that in odd F you can um, Probably since conjugacy problems solvable. Yeah, I have to think about it for a bit. But. So I'm confused. So do, doesn't the Messina Handel algorithm give you a way to detect it? I don't know. So, uh, no, so you, you, what you're thinking is you uh, run the train track, you build the train track, um, and if you find a reduction, you're reducible, and if not, you don't know. You have an irreducible train track representative, but you're not guaranteed that the thing is actually an irreducible. So, um, there are examples. It's not just that you know, no one's proven that, it's that there are examples of reducible automorphisms that are represented by an irreducible train track. So that's sort of the whole subtle Good question. Uh, yeah, so elements in here sort of naturally act on conjugacy classes. Um, and so I'll probably be a little bit sloppy and just talk about subgroups and things. But when I say things about periodic and stuff, I'm always talking about conjugacy classes. OK, um, so what does it mean to say that something is reducible? First of all, so an outer automorphism. Is 
is reducible um, if there's a factorization of the free group. So I can find a factorization of the free group such that the automorphism uh, permutes the AI. Uh, and of course, right, really what I mean is these are conjugacy classes. Right? I'll just be sloppy here and say that you know, this increments the AIs. Um, and if it's not reducible, then it's irreducible. Yeah, which page are we in there? Uh, the B is just something else. So there's a factorization where I have some free factors that are getting permuted, and you know, who knows? You could have just said A1 star A2. Uh, no, no. Saying that there's a splitting that's preserved is strong. I'm not saying that B is so. So B could get so this factorization might not be. Oh, oh yeah. I see. Yeah. yeah. Is it the same as saying that there's some power that fixes some free factor of kind of C? No, almost. Um, the problem is, is that this definition is not stable under iteration. So I'll pass to thing which is being stable under iteration, which is where the the full comes uh, in. Yeah. So, I mean, this is the original definition of being reducible and irreducible. Um, but the problem is, is that, I mean, irreducible things are nice. They have, you know, irreducible train track representatives. But this notion is not stable under iteration. Um, uh, I mean, the canonical example um, is take a pseudo Nassau mapping class on a surface with a boundary. Well, powers were useful to be so reasonable, right? Yeah, yeah but uh, I guess with dichotomy. So it's not stable. So you take a pseudo and also element on a surface um, with a boundary. So this gives you an outer automorphism of the free group. Um, and being irreducible is equivalent to saying that the elements, that the, that the pseudo and also transitively permutes the boundary component. Uh, so, you know, let me call it say, uh, F. The irreducible is only if F uh, is transitively. Transitively permutes. The boundary components. And so, I mean, obviously you could have F, which is transitively permuting it, but. If you have more than one boundary component, then some power of it is going to fix all of the boundary components, and so some power of it is going to be I mean, sort of the, the point is, I mean, if you have you know multiple boundary components on your surface, each one of them does represent a primitive element of the free group and a free factor, but they can't be simultaneously chosen to be part of a free factorization. That's the whole. That's the issue. Okay. But of course, if you have one boundary component, well, then that boundary component is in fact not free. Okay. Uh, all right, so yeah, so what we do then is instead of thinking uh, irreducible, um, we say fully irreducible, which is short for irreducible with irreducible powers. So irreducible with uh, irreducible powers. Is there some other abbreviation of that? I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So some people say I live. Um, if you're in France, they say you live. Um, but I'll say fully reducible. Okay, oh, yeah, and uh, this is exactly the thing that Andy was saying. So being fully reducible exactly means that there are no periodic free factors. So this is equivalent to saying no by periodic. Three factors. So I mean, this you know, if you're coming from the world of mapping class groups, which is hard, um, I mean, you know, it's reminiscent of the characterization of the pseudo Nassau as having no periodic. So these guys are never fully really reducible. These things, well, if there's a single boundary component, then it is. But if there's not, then yeah, because some power of them always fits. 
Okay. Fair enough. Great. Okay. Uh, so, um, so our theorem then. Um, is that there exists an effective algorithm for determining if an outer automorphism is fully reasonable. I mean, let me tell you what I mean by effective. Um, <laughs> I mean, you hand me an automorphism, um, and I can tell you how long my computer is going to take before it spits out again. Right, so if you hand me an automorphism, I will say, by the year 2514, I will tell you whether or not this thing <laughs> <laughs> So effective, right? So explicit money. And you will see that it is really that bad, too. <laughs> so there's really not a lot of <coughs> practical applications. Uh, but I do sort of mention this distinction because there is a, a, an, a, another algorithm um, you know, for determining if an outer automorphism is fully reducible. Um, so the time that the three of us were working on this theorem, uh, this paper by uh, Ilya Kapovich came out. Uh, with the same you know, statement, he has an algorithm for determining if an outer automorphism is fully reducible. Um, it's a completely different algorithm. Um, and at a few points in his algorithm, he runs sort of two machines at the same time. And he knows that one of them stops, but he doesn't know which one. So it's not a very explicit, the, the, uh, the uh, running time for the algorithm. So I mean, if you handed him a, uh, an automorphism, he would tell you the answer, but you never know how long it's going to And I will say, sort of in reference to uh, what Jason was saying, I mean, his is, you know, he runs the uh, Bestina handout to get a train track and then sort of analyzes when this train track actually gives you something fully reduced. Okay, um, so like I said, the way that ours work is we want to bound the volume of a free factor in terms of the word length of an automorphism. How old is the work of Cavendish? Uh, this, the preprint came out in uh, 2012, and I believe it just uh, was published uh, this year. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So, volume. Okay, so uh, you know, fix the basis of the free group. Um, so fix x a basis for the free group, um, and then consider the Cayley graph of your free group with respect to this basis. So consider t, uh, which sometimes if I want to stress there's the Cayley graph of this basis. All right, t sub x, um, the Cayley graph of f with respect to this basis. <coughs> okay, so the notion of volume is going to have a dependence on, on this basis here. Um, and so given uh, a subgroup of the free group, uh, we define the volume as following. So given A subgroup of F, <laughs> define the volume, which I'll use these Double vertical bars as just the number of edges in the Stallings core graph for A with respect to this basis. And I'll give a better definition of that, but you know what that is. You already know what I said. Um, so this is the number of edges in the Stallings core graph 
which, I mean, sort of the quickest way to say what it is, is, well, so, you know, the Cayley graph here is some tree. So A is a subgroup of F, so F, so A acts on this tree as well. So I can take the minimal subtree with respect to that action, and then I just take the quotient of that minimal subtree by A. So the Stalling's core graph, so I just take um, the minimal subtree, the T sub A, and quotient out by the action of A. Can I also take the quotient first and then the stuff off after branches off? Uh, well, if you, uh, yeah, yeah. So it's the same. So the other way to do it is, yeah. So you can take, yeah, you can take the quotient first and then take the core graph. So the smallest graph that contains every embedded cycle. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's the volume. Okay. Um, and yeah. So I'll also denote this just you know VOL volume. And I should say, I mean, this isn't some mysterious object. Um, I mean, this is completely computable. So, I mean, let me give you a quick little example. If you've never seen these things before, um, I mean, this isn't anything super mysterious. Um, so let's consider the free group of rank two, generated by two elements A and B. Consider the subgroup A, uh, which is generated by three words, A cube B. A inverse B, A, A squared, B inverse A. So call these say X1, X2, X3. And so if I want to compute this core in order to compute the volume, I mean all that I'm going to do is I'm first just going to make a wedge of three circles labeled with these elements, and then I'm just going to fold. And I'm going to fold until I can't fold anymore, and that's the map. So I'm just going to construct this uh, wedge of three circles. So let me say, I guess I'll label A with I guess, open arrows and B with closed arrows here. And so if I just label these petals according to the way the subgroup is defined, A, A, B, those uh, A inverse, B, A, B, and X3, A, A, B inverse A. Well, you see that there's some obvious foldings to do here, right? You see these edges here are exactly the same. So you fold those together. Those ones also agree. Those ones agree as well, too. And so if you just fold edges that you know look the same, that have the same you know, initial vertex, that do the same thing, fold those together, you'll arrive at the core, which in this case has six edges. Write down the generating set for your group. Make a wedge of circles, label each of those circles, fold as much as you can until you get down to something where they're no longer possible to fold at all. Um, this is the core. Um, and so you see that the volume here uh, is six. Okay? So this isn't some super you know, mysterious. It seems like there could be choices, right? If you drew your petals differently. Yeah, so uh, I mean, this is. Thing, right? yeah, you get this. Okay, and in the case when you know uh, this is just you know when A is just a cyclic subgroup generated by a single element, I mean you just get the, sync, the cyclic length of that word. So it's a very natural notion of complexity of a subgroup. Okay, um, so our main result then you know is in regards to this uh, this volume. Um, so let me just. 
there's a finite generating set. for the outer automorphism group. And then I'll just use a single bar here to denote word length. With respect to this generating set. And then the theorem we prove um, is the following. So we prove that there exists a computable constant C, uh, which depends on uh, you know, your basis X and your generating set S, um, such that given an outer automorphism, one of the following uh, happens. <coughs> such that given an outer automorphism, One of the following holes. So there's in fact three things here. I mean, if you were paying close attention, you might have imagined there'd only be two things, either things fully reducible or there's some short, um, with respect to volume, uh, periodic free factor. Unfortunately, that's a slight lie. So let me go ahead and write down those two conditions first. Uh, but there's also a third thing that can happen. So one of the three things hold. So condition one, we'll write down in a second. Condition two is that there is a five periodic uh, free factor A whose volume is less than or equal to C. Can you value what that is? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so this is, yeah. So this is, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll explain how the algorithm follows from this. Um, but it's known that, yeah, there's, it's like, you know, the notion of pure for mapping class groups. I can sort of pass to a finite index subgroup where periodic equals invariant. Okay. That's sort of a step one of the algorithm. Um, Okay, um, so either there's a periodic free factor, which is you know, short, um, or B is fully reducible. So this is where I would really like the theorem to be. Um, unfortunately, there's a case one here that can also happen that I would love to be able to eliminate, although I don't know how to do it right off the top of my head. Um, and there's something that goes wrong with our argument here when we look at cyclic free factors. And so the first possibility that can happen is that there is a phi invariant or phi periodic cyclic free factor. But possibly an enormous volume? Possibly an enormous volume. All right. But this is what we proved. So we prove that you know in the absence of a periodic or you should think invariant free factor, you know, cyclic free factor, one of these two things has to happen. And like I said, I would love to get rid of that, because I have no counterexample, although I don't know how to just prove that two or three has to happen. Okay? And like I said, this is computable. I mean, if you'd like to, I mean I can write down the exact function uh, for this thing in terms of X and S, if you they bug me hard enough. Okay, um, so anyway, let me tell you then how the algorithm works from this, because it's not quite as clean as what I said about how, you know, you just list everything that's small and check it, you know, because you have to somehow rule out case one first. And then in the absence of case one, then you can do the 90. And so you can rule out case one using some previously known algorithms. So let me go ahead and um, explain the algorithm. Okay, 
Okay, so the first step that we make is uh, this thing that Andy was talking about is um, I'm allowed to replace feed with some fixed power such that invariant and periodic are the same thing. So I don't have to worry about periodic things, I'm just looking for invariant. So this is due to uh, Fain and Handel. So I can um, replace phi with phi to the q, where you know q is just dependent on the rank of the free group, such that you know, phi and hence phi q periodic is the same thing as saying that it's invariant under phi to the q. Okay, so I never have to worry about periodic things. I can just look for just invariant things. Is this, just, is this the level three subunit? So by a work of um, Handel and Moser, this is a level three subgroup. But there was a previous paper with Fan, Fan and Handel where they just explicitly constructed. So I mean, this is you know this is like you know saying you have a pure mapping class, right? sort of taking a power so that you don't have to worry about finite work. Now. Okay, and so now uh, we use. Algorithms of uh, Vespina Handel, Turner, and Whitehead. So essentially, we can detect, in the absence of some sort of obvious reduction, we can rule out that that case one doesn't happen. So we can sort of use these algorithms here, and at the end of applying these algorithms, which you know, if someone wants to bug me about later on, um, I can go into more detail. Uh, so we use these algorithms uh, to conclude that either uh, phi is reducible. So either we find some obvious reduction, and so clearly we just stop. Or we conclude that case one doesn't happen. So we concluded that there does not exist a phi invariant uh, cyclic free factor. All right, so in other words, sorry about the scratchy. Not one, right? So I can either, you know, say, well, there's some sort of obvious reduction, so stop, or else I can tell you that, you know, in fact, there is no uh, invariant cyclic free factor. So case two or three has to happen. And so now I just do the 90 thing. So two or three. And so now I construct. Three factors with volume at most uh, this number. I mean, I don't actually need the word length. I just need something per bound on the word length. All right. So I mean, you know, automorphism. I just decompose it. Um, that'll give an upper bound here. So I construct all of the free factors with this volume, and I just test them to see if they're invariant. with any are fine right hey it's easy to enumerate all three factors with that volume bound. I didn't say it was easy okay <laughs> uh, you can do it you can, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll, uh, I'll tell you in a second here you can I'll give you a course upper bound as to how many there are and you'll see why this is not completely useless <laughs> <laughs> for anything yeah, I mean for anything more than I mean I would even attempt to try to program this um, okay, so you just tested any R phi invariant. Uh, if so, it's reusable. Else, it's fully reusable, right? If that doesn't happen, then case three has to happen. So it's fully reusable. Okay. And like I said, so let me give you sort of a, you know, 
coarse upper bound as to how many there are. <coughs> and I don't know, maybe if somebody knows the common reports better than I do, they can probably know a better upper bound. But let me just give you some upper bound so you at least see that I can tell you ahead of time how many of these you might have to possibly construct. Um, so, so the number of free factors uh, with volume less than or equal to m. Well, let's see, so how do you construct one of these things? Well, you just make a graph that has less than or equal to m edges. So <coughs> less than or equal to the number of graphs. Uh, with you know, less than or equal to m edges. Um, but of course, once you have a graph, you need to somehow decorate it a little bit to get a free factor. So each edge can be labeled with an element of your basis, and it can also be given assigned an orientation. Right? So you'll have like you know, 2 times the rank uh, to the number of edges. Okay. Um, and yeah, so let me make this a little bit cleaner too. So let me just um, well, let's see. This is probably this will probably this can do this to the end also. Oh yeah, the whole thing is to the end. Okay, and I mean I can say a little bit about the graphs. I mean I know the graphs have to be, for instance, they have to be connected, right? So um, they're connected. Um, they're not trees. They actually have some sort of you know, non-trivial fundamental group. So I know that the, the Euler characteristic of these graphs is non-positive. And so what's a rough number as to how many such graphs there are? Um, well, you can think of a graph with m edges. If you know that the Euler characteristic is negative, right, so it has to have more edges than vertices. And so how can you think of a graph with m edges? Well, think about the endpoints of the edges, and now you just have to say where those endpoints are attached to, right? So you have at most m vertices, and you just need to tell you where two m things go, right? You're going to think of these as sort of functions on the set of 2m with landing into something with uh, you know, the size m. So you know, m to the 2m. <laughs> and remember, m is really to this. <laughs> like I'm saying, yeah, this gets really big. Okay? Great. So what everyone's going to do. But we're happy. Um, okay, so let me go ahead and um, tell you some of the ingredients there and the proof of that theorem. Um, so, I mean, what I need to do is I need to relate to you the word length of an automorphism with the volume, right? And our tool that we use to relate the word length to the volume of a free factor is uh, the notion of an intersection number. So the tool to relate volume uh, to word length the notion of an intersection And so this notion of an intersection number uh, in the context of groups, uh, really for splittings of groups, was uh, originally defined by Scott. So this was really, he gave a notion of an intersection number between two splittings of a group. which really generalizes just the notion of geometric intersection number of curves on a surface. Uh, but the uh, sort of the framework where I need to use it in was, this was sort of generalized by uh, Gear et al. Um, to the context of just group actions on trees. So Scott, you know, given two splitting for the group, he gave you an intersection number. Um, Girardel says, you know, take your group, but act on two different trees, um, and he gives you an intersection number there. And it's really this latter context here that what I'm going to use 
in order to relate volume to word length. And so in the context that I'm going to be talking about intersection number, we're always going to be talking about trees uh, in outer space. So an intersection number takes two trees in outer space, and I'll say what that is here in just a moment. Um, so it's going to take you know, one tree and another tree and give you a non-negative uh, real number. Um, and it has you know, sort of the nice properties that you think about uh, intersection number having. Um, so it's symmetric. Uh, it's out f equivariant. Um, and you know, it scales nicely with respect to the scaling on all of these things. So okay, by homogeneous. Okay, I mean it's really just sort of generalizing the notion of the intersection number between curves on the surface. So let me tell you what uh, CV is. Um, and then I'll say sort of briefly about the intersection number. So CV, uh, this is the color of open outer space. So one way to think about this is uh, metric graphs with a fixed isomorphism from the free group to their fundamental group. So metric graphs, gamma uh, with a fixed isomorphism between the free group and their fundamental group. The way that I'm really going to be thinking about it in terms of this talk is, well, I can take the universal cover of this graph and I get a tree. and So this gives me an action of f on a simplicial tree. And that's really how I'll be thinking about outer space for this talk. So I can think about this as, um, um, not right, so I'm not, let me just say actions, reactions. F on simplicial trees. Okay. All right, so you can just see right just by taking the universal cover, I'll get the tree, and by taking the quotient, I get a graph. So it's not, not like simplicial trees like where everything is angular come up, right? The metric tree. Yeah, um, I guess I should say metric, yeah. Um, I mean I wanted to say simplicial so that I'm really not, you know, general R trees. Uh, but yeah, so trees, but yes, they have a metric on them. Um, another way to think about this, um, that I might say a couple of words about this at some time, um, without saying too many details, um, is that you can also think about color of open outer space as, uh, as sphere systems in the doubled handle body. Um, so you can think of this as weighted. Weighted sphere systems um, in the doubled handle body, uh, just the connect sum of S1 times S2, where the number of sum ends is just the rank of the free group. Uh, and I've lied, uh, well, I guess I need to just tell you what I mean by sphere system. Well, I should throw an adjective there. So, by weighted simple sphere systems. I want the complementary components to be simply connected. Universal cover, 
look at the list of all of those sphere systems, and you can construct a dual tree of that. So your complementary regions will be the vertices you connect to up if you know, they're adjacent by one of these spheres. Um, and the other way around, if you have an action on a tree, well, you can just take a map of the universal cover into this tree, pull back midpoints of edges, you get some surfaces, but you know, there's a nice way to cut them down so that you know that you have spheres. All right, and also um, mention as well, too, that um, in this, this third interpretation of outer space as weighted sphere systems, this intersection number is, in fact, just equal to the geometric intersection number. So, I mean, this was proved by uh, Camille Horvez. Um, that, uh, you know, looking at these different interpretations, but the Girardelli intersection number between trees equals the normal geometric intersection number you would have for spheres. Right? Just putting down, you know, looking at minimal intersection, minimal number of the components of intersection over you know, isotopic things. And then just multiply by weights or something? Exactly. Girardelli intersection of trees. In color open outer space equals the geometric intersection. Okay. And so I mean one of the dilemmas I'll state, uh, I mean you can prove it sort of, you know, either using trees or spheres, and I'll sort of give the a quick 20 second proof using that. So sometimes it's nice to go back and forth between these notions. Okay? So, so did, did Paul Bess show us a natural correspondence between intersections of spheres yeah. and squares mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the core really sort of shows you the combinatorics of how the spheres intersect. <coughs> Okay, um, let's see, but for, yeah, um, I was going to say a little bit about the intersection number just in terms of trees, um, but let me, I'd rather get to other stuff, uh, it's a little bit more interesting. So, um, if we have time at the end, maybe I'll say a little bit about how the, intersection number is just defined between, or how you can compute the intersection number between um, two trees in outer space. Okay, um, but like I said, so we need a couple of things, right? I want to, this notion of intersection number I was supposed to use to relate the notion of word length of an outer automorphism to volume of a, of a free factor. And so there's really sort of a, a couple of steps here. The first thing I want to do is I want to relate the word length of an outer automorphism just to some intersection number on the entire group. And then I want to say how to relate the intersection number on the entire group to an intersection number on a free factor. And then I want to see how to relate the intersection number on a free factor to the volume. So there's really sort of you know, three inequalities there that I want to string together to get that the volume is, is bounded by the word length. So the first one of these inequalities that really late, relates the, the word length, so the geometry of out of n, to the intersection number um, is a theorem by uh, Corbett as well. Now, I'm going to say it slightly differently than what he has stated in his paper. Um, but essentially, the arguments in his paper give this same result. Um, so take two points in outer space um, that are unit roses. So in other words, they're just Cayley graphs for some basis. So each edge has length one, um, and you take the quotient, you get a rose. So these are just Cayley graphs. Well, then you can bound the intersection number between S and T as follows. So the intersection. 
intersection number between s and t is bounded above by you know, some constant, which is in terms of the rank. And this uh, number lambda, which is something like a combinatorial Lipschitz constant between s and t. So let me tell you what lambda is. I won't give a complete definition of it, but what this is, is this is um, symmetric combinatorial Lipschitz. Or maybe symmetrized combinatorial Lipschitz constant is better. Um, but it's something, I mean, these things are metric spaces, so you can look for something like what's the best Lipschitz map between them. And this is something like measuring that, but it's a more combinatorial thing than just taking the metric into, into consideration. I mean, it's you know up to some constant. It's exactly the Lipschitz thing, but it's a little easier to state it with uh, this language for us. But the point is, this thing behaves like a Lipschitz constant. Um, so if I have my automorphism, and I sort of factor it into my finite generating set, well, I can bound the Lipschitz distance there by just the product of all of the other guys. And so, say t is, you know, my Cayley graph with respect to the basis x. Um, well, then what I see is that um, the intersection number of t, and then if I iterate t with my outer automorphism, is going to be bounded by <laughs> some constant raised to the word length of this thing behaves like a Lipschitz constant. I mean, essentially what this C-naught is, this is something like the max of all of these, you know, Lipschitz numbers where I just go over the generating set. So, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, this thing, you know, for all practical purposes, it behaves like a Lipschitz number. And so, you know, the, I decompose my automorphism into these guys that I can bound the Lipschitz number by just taking my problem. Okay? Okay, so this tells me, uh, gives me my way here about comparing the word length of my automorphism to this intersection number on the whole group. Okay? And so now the, the next lemma, which I really think was our, our main contribution to this whole thing, um, is I want to relate this intersection number on the group to an intersection number on a free factor. So let me go ahead and write down the statement, and then I'll draw the picture for surfaces, and you wonder why my statement doesn't look so nice. Um, so, lemma. Okay, so uh, suppose on A uh, is finitely generated and non cyclic. Okay? So take some subgroup. I mean, at this point, this is going to, you know, later on, this is going to be a non cyclic free factor, but for the context of this lemma, which is maybe why it's more general than what it should be, um, it's just some arbitrary subgroup, which is non cyclic. Um, so let S and T be as in that theorem over there. Um, B unit roses. And you know, S sub A inside of S, T sub A inside of T be the minimal subtrees. With respect to the action of A. So I'm going to take these trees and I'm going to let A act on them. So now I get um, these. You know, so now this tree S sub A and this tree S T sub A is in fact in the outer space corresponding to this subgroup A, right? Because these are three simplicial actions on, on trees. So I can, in particular, I can look at their intersection number. Um, and what we show is the following. Well, let me write down what I'd like to show, and then let me write down what we actually do show. Um, so if I look at the intersection number between these two trees, 
I mean, you would like to say that this is bounded by the intersection number of S and T. Somehow the intersection number, you know, in the whole group gives a bound on the intersection number in this free group, or sorry, in this subgroup. Um, but in fact, we can't show that. Um, what you get is the, the following. So there's some constant here, which turns out to not really matter in the end. Um, so let me just write it down. So it's 6 times this complexity of A um, times this number of lambda again. OK, so I mean, <coughs> yeah, so that's a little bit, uh, yeah, well, I mean, let me, Stop babbling and actually say something. Um, so, I mean, what's the picture in surfaces um, that we were trying to replicate in this uh, this lemma? Um, so, I mean, if you have some you know some subsurface um, S prime sitting inside of some surface S. Oh, I should stop using S. Is that enough? Let's say sigma sigma prime sitting inside of some surface S. <laughs> There's my subsurface, and you have some curves, right, that, you know, go along here. And so there's some curve alpha, some beta, there's some curve alpha. And then you can think about, you know, projecting those curves to the surface uh, sigma prime, right? And you can just think about, you know, they're either going to give you some arcs or some actual curves, and you can look about how much do those things intersect on the subsurface sigma prime as opposed to how much they intersect on the surface um, sigma, right? And I mean, obvious, right, that the intersection number of alpha projected to sigma prime and beta projected to sigma prime is bounded above by the intersection number on the whole surface. Okay? So you would like to say something like that here, that somehow the intersection number and this subgroup is bounded above by the intersection number of the whole group. Now, of course, I mean, there's something special about subsurface as opposed to just subgroup, right? So, I mean, we originally tried to throw some adjectives in here. Like, I mean, say it was malnormal or something like this. Or even say a free factor, although we didn't know how to really use that. Um, and even with those extra adjectives, we couldn't somehow remove this little bit. Um, so, we said, well, this is good enough for what we want, so let's just prove this as opposed to trying to prove what we actually think should be true. Um, so I guess I should say I don't, I mean, you can sort of think of like some, yeah, I guess I don't really even have a good counterexample as to why, you know, just even in general, if you're not restricting the free factors by, you know, this thing shouldn't, why it shouldn't hold with this thing just not here. Um, but as it stands, this is what we have. Is it, is it not true for a cyclic, cyclic case or is it not true? For a cyclic case, I mean, for a cyclic case, uh, the, I mean, the outer space is not there. So you can't really define, in that case, the minimal subtree is just a line, and there's no way to talk about the intersection number. So this is, yeah, one of the places where, you know, we have to talk about things being monster. Okay? I mean, what you would like to say, so I mean, I said that, you know, this proposition I had erased here that, you know, for things in outer space, right, this Girardel intersection number equals this geometric intersection number. So you would like to say, well, look at your double handle body, your manifold take some sub-object that corresponds to the free factor. You see the intersection on the free factor, so you know it has to be bounded by the intersection of the whole thing. But there's no canonical sub-object corresponding to a free factor. So you just, you're kind of stuck. So you really have to like work with trees here. So, man, unless someone else knows a way around it, it'd be great, but I mean, you have to sort of work with trees here to get, get this data. Okay, but anyway, this is great because um, we're almost done. I mean, again, this whole lambda thing, right? I mean, it's gonna just give me a, more of these things, so who really cares? <laughs> so, um, yeah, let me just sort of say the corollary again. So using the candy graph, uh, what do I see? So if I take the, you know, the minimal subtree of the candy graph, uh, and then I hit it with this automorphism, I take a minimal subtree, 
Well, you know, there'll be some new constant, but again, this is, you know, bounded by, you know, some exponential function of the word. Okay. And so now the last little bit I need to convince you of, um, I think I can do it in five minutes, um, is that if, you know, if A is, a, uh, is an invariant free factor, then in fact, this intersection number is going to give you an upper bound on the volume. That somehow, you know, this intersection is going to, I can find enough intersection that's going to be bigger than the volume. And this is again where we use um, you know, things being non-cyclic, um, or I can rule out case one, so it happens. So um, this is another lemma. Okay, so if If my outer automorphism is fully irreducible, then for some power p in between 1 uh, and the complexity of f, oh, sorry. I need to throw a tree in here first. Uh, so if p is fully irreducible, and t is a tree in outer space where all edge lengths have length at least one. Then there's some p in between one and the complexity such that the volume of t mod f is bounded by the intersection number with some other annoying constant. Let's get up times the intersection number. And so the way that I'm going to apply this lemma, and you'll essentially see why everything's done, I'll remind you again, is that so if I have my uh, automorphism, um, which doesn't have any invariant free factors, well then it has to have some free factor that it acts fully irreducibly on. So there's no invariant cyclic free factors. The smallest free factor, the smallest invariant free factor it has is going to be two, uh, or you know, two or whatever, something bigger than that. And so it's going to act fully irreducibly on that. And so this will just be the, the volume. Um, and so that'll essentially be the entire proof. But let me just give you the two second uh, proof of this theorem. Um, It's essentially just uh, the pigeonhole. So let me sort of think about this thing rather in terms of trees, but in terms of spheres. You can prove everything in terms of trees as well, but for the 20 second version, let me just give you the, the, um, the proof. Um, so if you think these the pigeonhole argument. So um, take the heaviest sphere. Uh, I guess little sigma. So that the volume, just the sum of the weight of the spheres, is going to be less than or equal to, well, the weight of this sphere. So, so this thing has weight w, which has to be at least 1. That's the hypothesis that all edge lengths have like 1. So the, the total volume here is going to be less than the number of maximum number of spheres, which is this complexity, uh, times this weight w. Which, since this thing is at most, sorry, at least one, is less than or equal to the complexity of f times w squared. Okay. Well, now just consider the set. Take the sphere, iterate it with your automorphism, blah blah blah. So since this thing is fully irreducible. It doesn't have any invariant spheres. I mean, this was back to a point that Dan said earlier about being fully irreducible and fixing a splitting. Being fully irreducible is stronger than saying that you don't fix a splitting. So being fully irreducible means that there's no invariant sphere. So two of these things have to intersect. And so those two things intersecting gives you the product of their weights. So two have to intersect. 
I mean, if you want to, if you're comfortable with, you know, things like curves on a surface, um, I think this is some curve and this is some pseudo and Ossov, and if I, the number of things here is more than the number of disjoint curves I can have. So two of them have to intersect. Two have to intersect, um, and so the, they at least contribute w squared to the intersection. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, and like I said, so I guess I have five seconds left, so let me just say rather than writing it down. But I, I have this point here. Well, if phi, if A is, you know, phi invariant, um, I can pass it, you know, enough power here such that I know that this intersection number is going to dominate the volume. And so I'll get that the volume then is dominated by As long as I don't have any uh, cyclic free factors that are invariant, my smallest one here is going to act fully irreducibly on that one. And so for that one, I know that I can make this quantity here at least as big as the volume. Okay. Uh, so, thank you. Questions? Mapping class group version of this is something about bounding like a length. So, yeah. so what's that? Can you say for? Yeah. So this was recently done by um, jo Joanna Mangahat and uh, Thomas Colbert. And do you have a version of this as well, too, Richard? So the statement. I guess first I should say the statement. <laughs> Tell me about it. I proved it. Um, so the statement there is that um, yeah. So there's some computable constant such that either. Your, um, so if your so if your mapping class is reducible, then there is a curve that is invariant or you know, periodic whose length is bounded by an exponential function of the word length. Mark Belt. Mark, okay. He's one of your. Is he also a self student? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So our, I mean, I saw Joanna give a talk about that, um, and then we started talking about trying to do something similar here. And I mean, I guess I would say that I would love to be able to reduce that, get rid of that case one, that there's this invariance. But the thing is, it's like, I, I mean, I need this, I need to know, I mean, like being fully reducible tells me something. I have some interesting dynamics. I don't know what to do if I just have a free factor that just sits there and doesn't have to do anything. So here I know that this thing is actually moving something around, so I can say that something happens. But I don't know what, what to say in the case that there's an invariant free factor. I should mention that there is this, Example due to stalling of, um, of an automorphism that's very small. Um, it's like a product of like two white and so it's a very short automorphism such that it does have a, a, a an invariant uh, free factor um, that's like gigantic. Um, so I don't know exactly how to um, yeah, I don't know how to get rid of that at first. Questions? Okay, we'll thank that again.